So understanding insects, that's what we will learn today. We'll start with that. Then protecting the plants from pests and diseases, as we have discussed just now. Uh, insecticides, not insecticides, but pest repellents made from organic materials, be it the neem leaves, uh, uh, the juice of the neem leaves, the juice of the onions and the chilies paste and uh, uh, garlic paste and all these kind of things you get from the kitchen and you can make your own pest repellents. And then there is the choosing the right seeds. Now, very important, uh, we have today on the market uh, the same shelf might be having selective seeds, hybrid seeds, native seeds, GMO seeds, and all these names will just make you confused. And you need to know what kind of seeds you are focused on to make a produce that is good for you. So every seed type has its own advantages and disadvantages. And we'll get to learn a little bit more about that today. Now, fertilizing the plants and watering them. This is a, a small topic that is actually just a revision of what we did. Basically, how do you put your compost into the soil and give back, you know, the peels and the uh, waste, organic waste is supposedly be, to be given back to the plants. And uh, what we are driving out from the farms or the gardens is that everything that goes out of the farm, it goes out with the waste product also of the organics. So like, for example, if you have the mango, the mango's uh, shell or the mango seed are supposed to be put back into the ground. We are just supposed to take the pulp, right? So that's the thing. Organic waste is supposed to come back to the farm, is supposed to go back to the gardens. So that's not happening. So we'll discuss that there. So that was just one example of how the circle is not getting complete. And that's that's why we need to bring in more things from outside, uh, which is not necessary if you complete the circle and understand the laws of nature. Okay, so insects, what is the meaning of an insect? In actual sense, when does an insect arrive? Now, for those viewers who are aware, there might be some places where you will see, if you are sitting in a one, a one place, you will see that there are two people, there are two kinds of people. One of them is bitten by mosquitoes more often than the other one. So just right on top of from that, you can understand that there is something different about one other person and you are being bitten, for example, with the mosquitoes and your friend or your neighbor which is sitting just next to you is not even bitten once. So how is this possible? So insects are the ones which control the normality of the whole earth balancing act. So like if you are having more amount of proteins in your body, right, then you will emit that kind of sweat. And that sweat is then understood by or detected by the mosquitoes that so-and-so person has high amount of protein in them. So let's go and make our eggs. So like I'm talking on behalf of the mosquito, the mosquito will think, Let's go and bite that person who has the more amount of protein in his body so that I can make the right amount of eggs. So it's just a basically survival thing. But yet you need to focus on what the indication is happening here. So if a person is healthy, he will have a right balance of all the three components, carbohydrates, proteins and vitamins and minerals. Right. So if you have a high amount of something, for example, proteins, then the mosquitoes will come and bite you and that's sort of like it should be taken as an indicator that you need to control your proteins or you need to get your kidneys checked because that's uh, it's not a good thing if you have a high amounts of high levels of protein that means you have high levels of uric acid also and uric acid basically crystallizes in your joint forms and then has you problems in the future of getting uh, the thyroid, uh, the gout problem, you know, it's a very serious problem, actually, your knees start to lock up and your joints start to ache and all these things starts because of uric acid moving around in your body system because of high levels of proteins. So these are small indications that the insects give. Wherever the produce is uh, ample in supply, the insects also are there. So you need to understand the insects are there to normalize. Like, for example, let's talk about the um, the the one that eats the wood, the dead wood. Do you know what that eats the dead wood? Termites, right? 
we can have a very havocful event when we have termites in our house because they go in after the furniture. Anything which is made of wood, they will come and destroy it. So if you think of it in a more um, universal way, the whole planet or the surface of the planet was full of trees, right? And had those trees not been eaten away by the termites or the dead and decomposing trunks of the trees, they were not eaten away by the termites, the whole surface of the earth would have been full of tree trunks, right? Because as the furniture in your house is still there intact, you can understand that the same way the trunks outside in the fields or in the farms or in the, uh, uh, the forest, they would still be there. They would just be existing there. Nothing would be eating the trunks. So there would be a whole, like a landfills of trunks of trees, so just fallen trees, the, die, the dead trees, just be de decomposing slowly, slowly, slowly out there in the wild. But when the termites come in, they come in and eat away into the wood and uh, convert into two soil. So it's another way of understanding now that the termites are coming into your home and trying to normalize what abnormality they see. And to them, they have a very small brain. They don't understand that this is called furniture. This is called a cupboard. And to them, it's dead wood. And what does dead, need, dead wood need to do to survive? Earth needs to survive for millions of years, right? So what does the insects have that assignment? The termites have the assignment to make it into soil. Anything which is dying, or dead, it will convert into two soil. So if you are worried that your plants are being attacked by termites, you need to understand that your plants are weak. Survival of the fittest, right? So if your plants are weak, that's when they'll be attacked by the termites. They will never attack a healthy tree. If you look at it very carefully, they will always attack a tree which is dying or which is sick. So this is a way of indication that every insect has its role and every insect needs to survive in the wild or be it in your garden. And we need to respect their roles. They are like sent by nature or kept by nature to make the earth work for millions and millions of years. And we need to understand that. Every time that we have an insect infestation, like for example, locusts come and eat away all your crops. So they are actually normalizing what is abnormal. Nature is about variety. Nature is about uh, mixed cropping, mixed farming. If you have an organic farm, you'll never have a locust swarm come and eat everything in your organic farm. Nature likes variety. And if you mimic that in your garden, in your farm or in your plantations, that will never happen that the locust will come and kill your produce. So we need to understand that. Wherever there is imbalance, the insects will come in and play their role. So you have to understand where is the imbalance. You have to look at yourself, you have to look at your own plot of land, and you have to understand that. Okay, so some are predators. I'm just uh, reading from the PowerPoint presentation. Some of them are predators, some of them are parasites, and others yet are the pollinators. Now, most of you know of the bees, they're the honeybees, they just go to each and every flower, and it takes about a thousand flowers for one drop of honey, you know. So that's the amount of honeybee. They just keep on working. This is saying that as a busy as a bee, you know. So that's the truth because every flower that they take the pollen, uh, sorry, the nectars from, it takes a thousand flowers to make one drop of honey. So these are the great workers of nature and we need to respect them. The predators and the parasites, we'll discuss them one by one and how they work into the uh, system of the garden also. If you have an abundant supply of nitrogen, like for example, you're using chemicals and you spray a lot of nitrogen onto the garden. Then to balance that imbalance that you have created, there's a lot of nutrients, for example. Now to balance it, how do you do it? You have to remove those nutrients. So the insects come and remove the nutrients by multiplying in your garden. So you will see that after some time, the insects have eaten their stuff, they've eaten your uh, garden up, and then now it is normal, the insects will also go away or they'll die off. So again, the whole point is the insects are coming to normalize what is abnormal. So we need to understand where is the abnormality. And in a natural garden or in an organic garden, most of the time the insects are balanced. Like there will be predators and there will be parasites. Each of them are surviving and each of them are killing them off each other. And they're surviving and they're doing their part and play. And now this is the best sentence you will hear. If it were not for the insects, 
the plants will not be making antibodies so for example if you are been bitten by a bee or you have been bitten by a mosquito what happens like for example if you have been never been bitten by a mosquito never been bitten by a bee if you are stung and for like last 20 to 30 years you never been bitten by any sort of insects what will happen is you'll get a very big bump here what is that uh, big bump signifies it signifies white cells they're coming and trying to kill all the antibodies or the acid that has been injected there by the bee or whatever it is but if you look at a farmer who is regularly bitten by the bees or regularly been bitten by the mosquitoes they will not have that big amount of bump that we will get ordinarily as people from the city or something like that because that farmer has antibodies in his system so they go they know what the poison is they will just go and fix it very quickly so similarly when plants are targeted by the insects the plants which are healthy they will create the antibodies and those antibodies then keep on moving in the plant system and also in the fruits and vegetables they produce so what do you want you need a produce that is made in the icu or in the lab laboratory conditions which is actually happening these days people are starting to do these things in greenhouses and closed environments right or do you want something which is full of antibodies, full of antioxidants and all these kind of things, which your body consumes that and your body also gets those antibodies into your system. So this is very important to understand. So the predators and the parasites are there to promote antibodies generation into the plants and that goes to the fruits and that goes to our system through the natural process of us eating that produce. So it's really important that the plants get being bitten by the insects or the get their sap being sucked by the uh, you know amphids and then the plant will create an antibody it will create a toxin for the uh, for the insect and then the insect will fly away so that toxin is moving around into the into the system and then it goes to the fruit also so mm -hmm. toxins are actually not bad for us if we look at it in a positive way it is a small amount of poison small amount of antibody which is released which is benefiting us also and increasing our immune system right so this is very interesting and very um, uh, an eye-opening thing that i also uh, got to realize that insects are good for your gardens okay what is weak will be eaten by the insects what is strong will get stronger by making antibodies that's what we discussed just now so this is really important to understand about insects now we're going to see a small video of what um, uh, insects are friendly and what insects are as enemies. So I'll just uh, play. If the sound is okay, you can just give me a shout out so that we can all hear it properly. This real black eggplant is off to a pretty good start and I have... Is the sound working fine? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll just continue playing. So this is an eggplant and we are seeing that how this has a small insect here and this is called the larvae of the ladybug. If you see this insect, we will zoom in into this uh, insect. If you see this insect, you should count yourself as very lucky because these larvae eat on amphids which suck away the sap of the plant. So these larvae are actually non-vegetarian eaters and they come and eat away onto the amphids that are living on the plant system. So I'll just continue with the video. I haven't noticed any flea beetles on it yet, but it does have a ladybug. For those of you who are new to gardening, ladybugs like to eat aphids. This is what ladybug larvae look like. Ladybugs and their larvae can eat dozens of aphids every single day. And this is what their eggs look like, in case you ever see any in your garden. Okay, so that was the picture of the ladybug. This real again. This is the larva of the ladybug. This is how it looks. I'm just trying to get it. This is the larva, and the, this is the eggs of the ladybug. So when you see the cluster of yellow eggs like this, again, it's a good sign because this will come out to be small larvae of the ladybug, and then it will turn to ladybugs in the future. So this is a positive sign. When you see this kind of yellow eggs onto your underneath your plant leaf. This is a good sign. Never say that this is something bad. You need to understand some sort of positive insects inside your garden and you need to leave these eggs where they are. Okay. This real black eggplant is off to... I'll just go to the next slide now. 
yeah this is a really good one now you just uh, get to realize what this this is an amphid amphid basically sucks on the sap of the tree uh, of the plant and it actually uh, like like literally uh, dehydrates the plants it sucks away the sap and the plant starts to wither so for fighting those amphids we need the ladybug so let's see how it works Got a plant? There's probably an aphid for that. They're a nightmare for anyone growing veggies. There are thousands of types with all kinds of looks. And they seem to pop up overnight. Before you know it, they're everywhere. Ugh. They pierce leaves and stems with their stylet and suck out sugary sap, leaving the plant yellow and wilted. While they're not particularly fast or well-armored, aphids are highly skilled at one thing, making babies. Most of the time, they give birth to live young instead of laying eggs. That's different from most other insects. Aw, she's got her mother's eyes. An aphid mom can push out five or six nymphs a day, sometimes more. And she doesn't need to find a mate to do it. Most of the time, aphids just clone themselves. You can see the eyes of her clones growing inside her. And here's the really wild part. Her babies are born already pregnant. In a week or two, they'll start giving birth to clones of their own. That's why it only takes a single aphid to infest your greenhouse or garden. When the buffet starts getting crowded and it looks like their food might run out, aphids switch gears. They produce a different kind of clone. See those light gray shoulder pads on the one on the right? They unfurl into wings. Yep, winged clones called alates. They look different, but they're still genetically identical to their mothers. When they're ready, the alates take to the air to search out new plants to colonize. A gathering this big attracts some hungry party crashers, like this ladybug. So some aphids strike a deal with ants. The ants treat aphids like dairy cows, looking after them and guarding them from predators. When these ranchers are thirsty, they tap on the aphids with their antennae. But instead of milk, these ant ranchers are looking for a tall drink of sweet aphid honeydew. That's the sugary waste that comes out of an aphid's um, backside. So is there anything that can stop these aggravating, endlessly self-replicating pests? Some growers use oils or insecticides. Others sick predators on them, like lacewing larvae. Or even unleash parasites, like these wasps. The female wasp uses her sharp ovipositor to inject an egg into the slow-moving aphids. When the wasp egg inside hatches, the larva eats and eats, hollowing out its host and turning it into a little mummy. When it's ready, the adult wasp chews its way out to start the cycle again. 
these tiny mummies are a gruesome sight, but they're one that let gardeners breathe a sigh of relief. So you guys learned today what happens, like wasps are there, the ladybugs are there, the amphids are there, everyone and everybody is just parting around in your garden and then you get to realize that all of these things are doing their work. But if you look at it carefully, they're just doing the normal work and trying to increase the uh, like the antibodies into the plant. And if the plant can survive that, then that means that it will produce some things or some fruits or vegetables which are full of antibodies. So this always happens when you have a lot of amount of a particular nutrition. Like if you have a lot of nitrogen, mostly amphids come into a place where there's a lot of nitrogen. And nitrogen, as we know, is coming from uh, fertilizer that you use like urea and all these kind of things. So a lot of uh, people don't understand is that when they use the artificial fertilizers, they are actually inviting the insects and the insects actually then come into your a farm or your garden and then you use pesticide on it so it's like a vicious circle you first put the fertilizer and then to kill the uh, the pest you kill the, uh, the you you use the pesticide so fertilizer pesticide then fertilizer then pesticide you keep on doing the wrong things all over again and again so you need to understand once you balance it with your compost and once the soil is balanced you don't need to worry about any kind of uh, infestations or in, insects or viruses. Some produce will actually go bad, but you need to understand that that is there for their survival. Like wasps can actually um, pu puncture your fruit and your pumpkin and your mango and all these things, but then you need to understand that they are also surviving. So you will have one or two mangoes which are gone bad because of the uh, fruit fly, for example, but you need to understand that this is their world also. We cannot be so greedy and tell that everything is ours. We need to give off some off of our um, good, good material that we get, fruits or vegetables, be it be any, any of it, to give it to the nature. And these are all the workers of the nature also. So we need to have an open eye, an open heart for this, because this is how you will actually learn that they are also there to benefit. And we are also benefiting from their work, right? So... These are the couple of just a sample of what the insects do and how they work in controlling each other also. So we need not worry about them so much if we are doing it in a balanced way. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So some of the preparations that we use to control this pest. Now, the best I have found yet is the use of bio water, like biogas slurry. Now, this is basically uh, when you have a biogas plant, you put in the raw material from one end and then there's bio slurry that is ejected from the other end. Now, that bio slurry is the one which is actually the one which is creating a lot of nutrients in soluble form, right? So, I'm just uh, going back to the, to the bio slurry. It, it is basically a potent fertilizer. Like when you put the fertilizer, it stays on top because it's a solid form. But biogas slurry, I'll share a video on the group on how to make the bio slurry, is basically just mixing cow dung, fresh cow dung, and you mix it with water, like one parts, like one, one kg or two kg of cow dung. You mix it with like 10 liters of water, and then you just leave it for a couple of days, and you keep on mixing it five times clockwise, five times anti-clockwise. You just leave it for five days. You keep on doing that every day, twice a day, in fact. And then on the fifth day, the bio water is ready. And that you can just sieve it. You can just use some sort of cloth or material like that. And you can just sieve that water. And that water is the best pesticides because it has a lot of microbes and bacteria. And imagine if you are sprayed with lots of bacteria and microbes and you are such a very small insect, what will you do? You'll start to suffocate between those microbes and bacteria. So bio water or bio slurry is the best way to control this pest. And it has a very, very effective way. Like you spray it right now and within the couple of hours, they will all start to move away or die out. So this is another way of keeping your plants healthy, bio water just the use of cow dung and water. Cow dung, one to two cakes of cow dung, fresh cow dung, 
and mix it with 10, 10 liters of water in a drum or somewhere outside, leave it outside, have it covered so that no other uh, insects can fall in and die in and all these things. And then you just keep on mixing it twice a day for five days and that water will be full of those anti, uh, those bacteria and viruses and multiplying the water and you just sieve that water. The next one we discussed was buttermilk. The sour it is, the older it is, the better it is. So this is the secret. Like imagine you are drinking buttermilk and sometimes the buttermilk has gone sour. It's like two, three days it has been left outside. So you will feel it's too sour. Now imagine the bacteria in the, uh, sorry, the insects that are there in your garden and they have very small eyes and they have very small noses. So what will happen when you spray this kind of buttermilk on them? They will get very irritated and they will just run away from your garden. So this is another very effective way of controlling the pests and uh, parasites in your garden. Another one is neem extract. Now we are all aware of the benefits of neem in our system also. Our ancestors used to brush their teeth with neem, uh, you know, uh, small branches of neem. And this kept them uh, very healthy, their teeth very healthy, their gums very healthy. And they, it, it actually uh, induced their digestion process to be very, very strong because that was a alkaline or it's a base material what the neem has. So the juice of that, the leaf extract, like you just grind the leaves, like maybe two handfuls of leaves. You can just collect the green leaves and just grind them up into a paste and then mix it with water and then you grind it again. And then you sieve that water, then you can use that water now, like maybe two handfuls to maybe two liters of water. I'm giving you a really, very really rough estimate, but you just also need to understand that these medicinal things that we are creating are actually be supposed to be consumed within two to three days. So you need not make a big jerry can, and then you need you you will you will think that this will survive me for the month. Don't do that. You need to make it fresh because we are using organic pest uh, pest repellents. So you need to understand that this has to be sort of fresh. Otherwise, it has no potency. The chemicals will or the compounds will decompose to their uh, normal state and they will just have no power maybe after two to three days. So you need to keep on uh, making this uh, sort of fresh. Maximum we can use for a week. All these that I'm, I'm mentioning here, after a week, they will start using their power and they will start uh, you know, even smelling bad sometimes. So you need to understand, just use them fresh. How to use them? I'll just give you a small example. Like for the any sort of uh, uh, infestation, which is mild, you can try any combinations of these three. Like you can try with a bio slurry first. The bio slurry is the best one yet. I have I have never found anything better than this. But if it doesn't work, if the bio slurry does not work, you can go to the buttermilk and the neem extract. And you can see on the plant how it is affecting it. And if none of them work, then there is a very a potent mixture which is made up of uh, onion paste, lemon juice, chili paste. Now all these three ingredients are very potent in each of the sectors. Like chili is very very you know in, extreme in one end and lemon and uh, onion are also in their extreme ends and then you mix them up. You mix their pastes together and then you mix it with water and then you spray that. Now you can imagine what like it is the best uh, alternative, best uh, like is called Rambar Kete, for example. Nothing works, then this will work. So this is the kind of uh, grading that you do for yourself, right? So if nothing works above uh, of these three, then you can try this combination. I've just written a rough formula again. Like onions, you can use one or two onions and then lemon, maybe one lemon there. Chilies, a couple of chilies, two or three chilies, very, uh, very um, chilly, you know, basically. Uh, you can use that and you use one parts for 500 so it's like uh, one spoon for 500 spoons or you can just say one uh, like 100 ml to 500 ml it's a it's a combination like that so 100 gram paste for 500 uh, these things so 500 ml of water so you just need to uh, divert it like that so yeah this is uh, one great way of uh, making your own pest repellents and without any cost or, and you will also get to learn which is the best performing for you and you will also experiment like that. The gardener is the best experimenter and the best scientist. So these are one of the ways that you can go ahead and uh, 
do that so the best insect repellent for fruit flies now fruit flies are the ones that are uh, targeted by the uh, by the flies that the fruit is there hanging on the tree let's just give you an example and the fruit flies come in and start to lay their eggs inside so this is what uh, damage it does sometimes even in the tomatoes you might see this these are all the um, uh, areas where the fruit fly has laid their eggs so it's actually a gruesome sight next time you will see the tomato with something like this you should try to avoid it or at least remove this portion here before using that because it has the eggs it has been bitten by the uh, fruit fly uh, basically the eggs have been laid inside it so to away this or to shoo away these insects what we need to use is milk now milk as we all know goes bad very quickly so when it goes bad it starts to smell very bad so imagine if you are if you are spraying these fruits with uh, milk now you will wonder how much what is the formula you can just not go and spray milk all over the garden you know it will be first of all um, create a uh, an expense which is actually more than what you anticipated so half water half milk that's the formula for using the milk half water half milk that's what you use and this will basically create a foul smell for the insect we will not be able to smell this but when you spray it the milk goes out in the air oxidizes and starts to rot and it sticks on the fruit now when it is stuck on the fruit it is also decomposing so the milk is also giving out odor or smell which is not pleasant for the fruit fly so the fruit fly which will not which is attracted by the fruit when the fruit is getting ripe, it starts to produce that kind of smell. So the fruit fly is attracted to that smell. So now we have cancelled that smell out with the rotting smell of the milk. Rotting I'm using because we will not be able to smell the rot. But the fruit fly, it will smell the rot. So it will not come near the fruits that are ripening in your garden. So milk is a very good way to, to save your produce of the garden. Yeah. Okay. So we are now going to the seeds. Do, does anyone have any question till now? Anything you don't understand or you have a query? Yeah. Have a question. A question. Yes. First question is, the buttermilk you have told me. Yes. This may, this could dilute it. When the buttermilk is old, it will be very bitter. Now, we will dilute it in water. Yeah. Okay, good question. The buttermilk is uh, already diluted. If I'm not mistaken, it is made from yogurt. And if you are making buttermilk, you already diluted it in one sense. So see, now if, if you dilute it more, the bacteria are not able to get any food. So you need to also understand that the food is in the milk part of the buttermilk. So if you leave it uh, like just the way it is normally, you don't need to put water in it, but just the normal buttermilk that we are taking, just leave it like that. Don't dilute it, right? That is the best way because that will get sour faster. If you put water in it, it will get sour slowly and it will run out of food for the bacteria. So if you're leaving the, uh, the buttermilk outside in a drum and you're diluting all the time, the bacteria will not have any food to eat and they will multiply in abundance but they have no food to eat. So what will happen? They will kill each other off and they will die out. So diluting it as actually creates an environment where they are going to kill themselves because they will multiply in abundance. Whatever the amount of water it is, they will multiply all over in that water and the buttermilk. And then they will also start to see there's no food now. The milk part is not there. So they will start killing each other. They will die out of nutrients. And so that will be a, a waste actually. Before spring, uh, should we dilute it? Yeah. So just leave the amount of water it is normally and that's good enough. You don't need to dilute it. You just need to dilute the milk uh, insect repellent I was telling you about. No, you need to use, uh, yeah, that's a good question. You can use any, any kind of milk. We can even use the milk that has gone bad. That's actually good. But then if the milk has gone bad for today, then you can use that on the on the fruits because that is still milk if you use it tomorrow then that has turned into yogurt or that has you know basically fat jata hai. so that that is no longer milk now that you can use it as a butter milk because that has gone bad you know so i'm talking about fresh milk 
or fresh milk which is actually today's milk and it has gone bad for example so you can use that quickly in the garden and put it on the uh, fruits that you have so that's a good way of actually uh, up up cycling the milk you know instead of throwing it down the drain so yeah one more Shall we? Uh, yes उटसाइड you know so if you spray it with the milk you can try it if you spray with the milk but the already what will happen is you have to be like thinking a couple of weeks behind so when the fruit start to appear in your plant spray it that time and then you regularly spray it maybe a uh, a week or once in a week or two three times in a uh, twice in a week that's the maximum you can do once in a week or twice twice a week you can spray the milk in that small fruit that you are seeing appear बिकॉज अभी जितना भी फ्रूट लगे होंगे ऑलरेडी यू डोंट नो वेर द वॉस्प हैज अटैक्ट इट ऑलरेडी सो इवन इफ यू पुट द मिल्क नाउ द एग्स हैव ऑलरेडी बीन लेड इन साइड द फ्रूट सो इफ यू आर स्टार्टिंग टू अंडरस्टैंड द बेनिफिट यू हैव टू बी ओपन माइंडेड एंड से लेट मी सी इफ इट इज वर्किंग और नॉट फॉर दैट यू हैव टू थिंक साइंटिफिकली कैट वेन द फ्रूट इज जस्ट स्टार्टिंग यू क्विकली स्प्रेड विद द मिल्क सो दैट विल अवॉइड द वॉस टू कम इन यर इट फ्रॉम डे वन सो दैट्स वॉट यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड राइट Thank yeah. You. Yes. Shall we continue? Yes. Duration once a week. Yeah. Spray. करने का duration twice or once a week. Means. Let Let's try. Let's try with once a week. Let's try with once a week. I am saying this in the monsoon time. You might be wanting to do it twice a week because it's monsoon. So बारिश से धुल जाता है. So the monsoon will wash away the milk, for example. But Uh, i am saying after monsoons maybe you can do it once a week right now you just try it twice a week also it's not an issue because it's not such a it's not such a huge amount you just need to prepare like 200 or 300 ml not more than that you know so if for that milk you will just need maybe 100 ml you know so that that is also not such a waste of time so you can do it twice a week for now because it's a monsoon yeah but in the summer time or when there is no uh, way of evaporating or uh, washing away of the milk you can use it once a week right after monsoons okay so we can continue with the seeds now right this is another very important uh, topic of the day because uh, we have these packets that we are coming to see and uh, this packet seeds are uh, written this small words that you see here hybrid seeds now we need to understand what this means and a hybrid seed is basically a seed that has been produced from two contributions like it is a plant like you have a tomato plant which is producing very good uh, sweet tomatoes but they are very small in quantity and then there is another plant which is producing a lot of tomatoes but not so sweet so now what they do is they cross pollinate those plants and then they create those seeds from there in laboratory conditions and those are called hybrid seeds so hybrid seeds have very varied variations of their subspecies what i mean by that is when you grow hybrid seeds the produce will be very good there will be sweet tomatoes also and there will be a lot in quantity also but the seeds of the hybrid seeds will not be able to continue their generation they will not have the seeds inside their produce like for example the papaya we are all aware of it this is called a hybrid papaya we know that this is a hybrid papaya because it has very less seeds you can see that this papaya itself it has no generational continuity it doesn't know what to create as a seed so it doesn't create the seeds and in the process its generation does not continue and this is called a hybrid seeds and this is actually if you look at it in long term basis this is called dependency you are dependent on the uh, seeds from the shop you don't know if the seeds that are there will be growing properly or not in the future so you don't have your own seed bank you are dependent on the gardener shop or the seed shop that you have across the corner of your garden uh, uh, street 
so you need to be aware that you you if you are a good gardener you need to be selecting the seeds you need to be saving your own seeds and if we are uh, remembering our papayas that were before it had a lot of seeds so the way nature works is the nature is just giving you a little bit of pulp but actually taking care of itself first so it has a lot of seeds so this is another another way of understanding if something is a hybrid or something is natural whatever is natural the seed will always be big and the 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 pulp will be less but the pulp will be sweeter the pulp will be tastier but the pulp will be less so this is the secret that we can all uh, i i mean i see it commonly happening you know the more the seeds there are or the bigger the seed it is and the pulp which is thinner or the pulp which is tastier it is obviously the natural seed so we can save those seeds and whatever which is having less seeds or seeds that are not developed we can understand that these are hybrid seeds in fact they label it on front of the packets also they like they write to label uh, the hybrid seeds so what you need to do is to focus on seeds which are selective seeds now selective seeds or native seeds these are the words that you need to see in the packets native seeds or selective seeds selective seeds is basically seeds that are selected to have a good produce which are still natural so you need to see these two words in your packet of seeds this is not common these days because these kind of seeds are actually uh, native in that area alone so for example they are not able to sell this native this uh, local selective seeds or native seeds in another country or another town or another state but they can sell hybrid seeds because those are made in laboratory conditions and those have diverse uh, genes from other plants so they are able to grow so nobody is selling selective seeds because they cannot be grown outside the state because the climate conditions are different so you need to connect with farmers or you need to connect with the local people who are growing these kind of things and you need to connect with them and get seeds from them which will be, then become your part of your seed bank so this is very uh, a very important part of gardening and farming you need to focus on seeds that are local in your area and they will be actually pest resistant because they are in your climatic conditions they have been grown up the hybrid seeds are created in laboratory conditions so they are people or if you are considering them as people they are people who are in icu they will always need some thing or the other some sort of intervention good uh, amount of food on the right time water has to be purified ro plant water has to be there and all these things then they will give the fruit but selective seeds even the water can be hard water bore water can be there but as long as the seeds is local then they will do, give you good produce and they will be pest resistant also so these seeds are actually more productive uh, at the, in the long run so this we need to understand these things of course then the, there is the gmo seeds gmo seeds are i am sure you are, you guys are aware i'll not read the whole chapter i'll just summarize what it is basically a gene from a rat or a gene from a a pig or something they mix it together with some sort of plant and then they make it into a pr productive thing like this sweet corn that we know we are very aware of it this sweet corn which is in the lower part is actually genetically modified sweet corn and this sweet corn is the one which is not genetically modified these are the seeds attacked by the some some sort of worm here so now obviously what will you choose you will choose obviously the genetically modified seeds because we want uh, economics economics are working on these things right so the farmers are being sold these kind of seeds genetically modified seeds and then these genetically modified seeds have not evolved over millions of years of evolution so what, when you take a gene from a rat or a pig and you mix it with these kind of things th there is an article on this i'll share with you a maize corn was white in color they used the black gene of a rat and put it into the maize corn and the maize seed started turning black so now the maize corn the taste was the same the texture was the same the fragrance was the same just the color of the uh, the maize beans the maize uh, yeah beans were black, uh, were black in color so now we what will happen after like consuming it once twice thrice down its generation we don't know that is the big question that is the problem with gmos we don't know so if we continue with this kind of gmo produces the produce will be good 
But does the produce have antibodies? Does the produce have micronutrients? Does the produce have the, all the things that are necessary for our survival? Sometimes this produce which is there, which is left behind the farmers, the farmers are left behind with this kind of produce and they are getting the best of antibodies. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because something is crooked, because something has been eaten away, they don't sell it to the market. The market will not buy it. So what they do is they keep it for themselves. And in the process, indirectly, all farmers stay healthy. And all people who go and buy things with money, which look so good actually, are actually just the ones which have been made in ICU conditions. Like if the ICU conditions are, conditions are right, then you get this kind of produce. Right. So this is very interesting to see. Sometimes we will see a bottle guard which is crooked like this. We will say, Ye nahi chahiye. we don't want that bottle guard. But actually that has been bitten by the wasp. And so that bottle guard has antibodies inside it. Because as it was growing, it was struggling with that, um, that, uh, that wasp bite. And it has created antibodies. And those antibodies were circulating into the plant and in, indirectly into the fruit. So next time you see something which is crooked, which is bent or which has been bitten, you have to understand that this plant or this produce has antibodies in it. It's a new way of looking at the things, right? So this is the three types of uh, uh, seeds that we have. And we need to focus on native selective seeds. That is what we need to focus on. Of course, you can go for hybrid seeds, but then these will be, have to be very careful so the type of compost that you give it, we have to be very careful. Sometimes they will give a good produce. Other times they'll be attacked by the insects because these are made in laboratory conditions somewhere outside your state, obviously. So that's how hybrid seeds have very varied uh, sort of outputs. You never know how the output will be. And obviously they, they will get off by saying you didn't follow the instructions or you gave it too much water or you gave it too much fertilizer and they will get away with it. So... You have to be very careful. You have to be smart enough to use seeds that are in your locale, in your local environment and up to your um, capacity to understand that this will survive in your climate. right? And not to mention these uh, native uh, produces are sweeter and more tastier. The texture is good. The colors are good. So that's one other thing about the native selective seeds. Okay. So now we're moving on to the fertilizing plants and how to use them. Uh, best fertilizer is again bio water. So I'm just uh, going to the next uh, slide again and showing you. The bio water is basically bio slurry. So this is cow dung. It goes into this. This is like a, you can make it at home. In fact, I'll give you a video of how you can make it at home. This is a barrel for like uh, 20 liter barrel, uh, sorry, 200 liter barrel. And this barrel has been converted to a bio uh, digester. So what happens is you put your food waste inside here. First, you need to put cow dung inside here mixed with water. So it becomes cow dung slurry. It goes in here. It does its activity inside here. And then it rises up as the water with the cow dung has worked and finished its creation of methane gas. The water will rise up. And then that water, the light water stays on top while the heavy producing bacteria working down there are producing their work and then it's rising up again. So the water which is light, which is ready to go outside in the farm will rise up and then it will come out from this pipe which is so you can see here. So for example, you put in 10 liters of bio slurry in this area. So it will produce 10 liter of bio slurry from here. It's as simple as that. So for example, today you put uh, cow dung slurry in here and then it will produce that kind of slurry here. You take that slurry into your garden and you put it directly the way this lady is doing it. So this actually goes to the root system and this slurry has bio uh, microorganisms, bacteria and viruses in, in lakhs and crores. And then those actually feed to the root system as we had discussed before by giving to the plant in soluble forms. All the nutrients, zinc, iron, and all these kind of micronutrients that you need, calcium, magnesium, and all these things, and are given in soluble form to the plant. 
So bio water is the best fertilizer. This is your own way of doing it at home. You just need to collect maybe one or two cakes of uh, cow dung, fresh cow dung. You mix it with water and you make it into a bio slurry and you just put it inside this thing and it goes at the lower level. It does its work. And once it's finished its work, it rises up, the water stays up. And for example, you put uh, another bio slurry inside here or you put kitchen waste. You can put even kitchen waste in this. You chop it up and you put it in this size. This is like a four to six inch pipe here. So you just make it manageable that it goes in easily or you can push it in with a stick. And then when that kitchen goes, uh, waste goes in here, it stays here and it starts to decompose with the bacteria which are there already by the cow dung. So you need to put the cow dung first and then you can put the kitchen waste after one month or something like that. So then that kitchen waste would also turn into bio slurry and then you can get that bio slurry out here also. So it's all about feeding the soil, feeding the soil. What we are doing right now is any green waste that we have, the kitchen waste that we have, we are taking it and throwing it out and giving it to the garbage man. Whereas that is the very things that you can use to use as a fertilizer. And you can use this simple device that is there, you know. Of course, composting is there, but composting takes how much? Two to three months. How much does a biogas digester take? About 48 hours. That's it. You can put your kitchen waste in here and that within 48 hours will get digested and it will remove that amount of water in there. Whatever is solid which is left behind will stay in the lower level. And you can keep on adding water or bio slurry and it will keep on producing the, the water which is already light. So the biogas digester is a very quick digester. As we have discussed, the cow eats grass today and it defecates cow dung tomorrow. What happened? Within 24 hours, the bacteria and viruses in its stomach had converted that into almost soil. So that's how it happens. 24 hours, grass, green grass turns into black organic fertilizer. You know, so how is that happening? Bacteria and viruses in their stomach of the cow. So this is almost like a stomach of a cow. It acts like a stomach of a cow and it decomposes anything which comes in here in this pipe and it turns it to bio slurry and this bio slurry is the best way of fertilizing your produce. This is at a bigger form, like you are collecting the gas also from here. This will not generate so much gas. There is a small pipe which is actually visible there. You can see here it's written gas outlet. I don't think, uh, let me just try and, yeah, if you can read it, gas outlet, it's written here. So there is a small gas outlet here. This is the amount of small gas that is being produced here. This methane gas can actually be used in your um, stove also. But it is a very small amount because this is a 200 liter barrel. If you go to the bigger sizes, if you have a bigger plot of land, you can see there is an inlet here. You can put your kitchen waste here, cow dung here, all these things here. And that uh, slurry goes in here and stays in here for 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever it is. And the next day you put something in here, it removes the slurry in this pipe. You can see this pipe is actually connected with this device here. And this is called the biogas digester. So this is when you have a bigger plot of land, you have cows with you, so you can buy this and invest in this. And this ballooning effect is happening because there is methane gas happening in here, is being generated in here. And that can be con converted. This is a demoisturizer here. So that methane gas comes in here, it passes through here, the water droplets drop down here and the gas goes out and you can use it into your kitchen. So this is a very efficient way of using your green waste. And of course, the fertilizer comes out here and you can use that directly to your farm. So this is in a bigger scale. But the best fertilizer I have experienced with all my experience in this field is this bio water or bio slurry. And it's the best form of pesticide, uh, sorry, pest repellents. We're not using the wrong words, not killing any pests. Pest repellents is the biogas, uh, bio slurry that we, we get from the biogas plant. Uh, the second best is the vermicompost. We are all aware of how they are making it. There is a simple way of putting it is be, we just put a lot of worms and we put organic waste on top of it and the earthworms comes on top. They eat away all the stuff that is there uh, on top of it and then they go down into the shade, into the cold area and then you collect from top of it the worm castings and those are the best sort of fertilizer. So this is the second best. This is in solid form. 
this was in liquid form so when you put this this goes to the root system directly whereas this is staying on top of the root or it's besides the root so this is actually not so efficient because this is in solid form so we need to understand that it gives uh, produce but after a while it gives produce after a while after it has you give it water after the microbial bacteria have generated their connections together with the worm castings and then they produce then they produce to the plants and then the plants get it so this is uh, a little bit time consuming then compared to bio slurry then we have this uh, vermi wash now this is again a good way of converting your uh, green waste and you using it uh, simply form this is the best uh, sort of design i have seen yet like you just put your green waste on top of this here and you mix it with cow dung and you can see here compost cow dung uh, and dung and worms this is what is happening here on top layer there is compost basically kitchen waste and then you have the uh, worms and then you have the uh, uh, dung of the cow so three things are on top of this area and then there is a thin dung layer like this is created a thin dung layer is there then there is sand now this sand is actually helping the worms not to go below at this level and then there is pebbles at the end here so now there is water trickling down from this pot and this pot is washing away the worm castings and taking those nutrients down and then they are collected over here and this is called wormy wash now this wormy wash you can see it's been collected here and there's a tap here so basically the tap is sort of connected here if you look at this model this tap is connected directly here so the liquid is connect, collected in these pebbles and that liquid is called wormy wash so basically it's the wash of worm castings like you mix the worm castings in water and what that color you get blackish color that liquid is coming down and is being collected now this is again a liquid fertilizer so it's also very good and you're also getting rid of your kitchen waste and all these things you're mixing your kitchen with the cow dung and the earthworms comes and eats it up and then they go back down and then you put your another waste again so it, they come and eat it up and they go down and you're dropping water on top of it now these are uh, pots uh, used here why are they clay pots because clay pots are uh, conducive for the temperature like it reduces the temperature of the water so this is good for the earthworms so even if you can leave this outside in the hot area but since it's the water is cold from top and it is just trickling drop by drop by drop from here you can see there is a cotton wick here and it is dropping drop by drop here uh, it's not so clear here but basically there is a cotton wick here and the water is dropping from here you are filling this water uh, every like for example every day and the whole day it's trickling down and that trickle is collected at the bottom area so this is another way of using your fertilizer i am showing you the best and the most um, productive sort of fertilizers uh, you can use obviously other kind of fertilizers are out there you, we can discuss that in the group also but these are the ones that have found the best and they are actually using your kitchen waste also directly or indirectly which is to add to your fertility also so if you have any questions you can ask me in the group also but i'm just going through it quickly because we are also time restraint on this thing and uh, we're just uh, coming now to the last one which is called the worm tower now this is the just i had seen it recently i found it very interesting if you have kitchen waste this is a really good video to understand and we'll just get to it quickly this is a worm tower, which gives us infinite amounts of worms, compost, and liquid fertilizer. Also, fun fact, many people in their basement end up making worms through these worm towers and can make up to $100,000 a year just by selling the worms. It's been 90 days since we set it up, which means the population of the worms should have doubled. By just giving it a quick glance, we can definitely see that there are many more worms in there than the original amount. To make one, you'll need three five-gallon buckets. Make sure they're food grade. One of the buckets needs to have a solid bottom, and the other two need to have holes cut out. You'll stack all three buckets together, ensuring the top two are the ones with the holes cut out in the bottom. You'll seal the middle bucket's holes with newspaper. Then you'll add in the organic matter that will be turned into compost. Over the next three to six months, the worms will break down the organic matter into compost, and their population size will double every 90 days. When all the organic matter has been broken down, the worms will travel through the holes through the bucket above them because we just put in new organic matter. We then can extract the compost from the middle bucket, and then put it on top and put new compost on top of that, repeating the process. Okay, that was very quick, but 
uh, to the point i'll just uh, go to the point where it's actually uh, making sense so this is how um, this is designed the first bucket which is at the lower level is solid it doesn't have any holes the second bucket has the holes and the third bucket has the holes so this bucket has the holes and this bucket has the holes i i am not able to show the pointer so the, this is the first bucket which is there it has no holes the second bucket and the third bucket has the holes and these holes the first bucket is filled up with the compost material and the earthworms and then the after like 15 to 20 days they fill up the the last bucket on top of it the third bucket on top with the compost new compost material without the worms so when they fill up without the worms the worms from here will travel to the third bucket on top and the bucket which is the middle will have the worm castings so the worm castings as they are showing here they will be filled up with worm castings here and the earthworms have traveled up because on top you have put the new compost and the new kitchen waste like i mean let me just try to find it here okay they not they not clarifying it but basically yeah there it is so this is after the earthworms have eaten this after 15 days you put new kitchen waste on the third bucket on top and then the earthworms go from this bucket to this bucket and then you just remove the middle bucket which has the worm castings and you remove this bucket and you can use that now into the kitchen and this third bucket which was there goes inside the first bucket and the one which you remove the compost the middle one goes on top like the way they showed it this this is how it showed it the one which is there the middle it's the one which had the worm castings this one had the compost this one has the compost this one has the the worm castings and this one is collecting the liquid so that's how it's working uh it's a little bit complicated but this is a very good way of getting rid of kitchen waste and you are just cycling the buckets and you are generating your own uh, worm castings and you are able to get your own fertilizer there and you're getting rid of your gin waste you know so instead of throwing out those peels and uh, all those potato peels and tomatoes uh, uh, onion leaf peels and all these things you are using it and converting it into worm castings so this is another good way of doing it and worms also like uh, cow dung very much so you are putting a little bit of cow dung with this so that the worms like to eat on that green waste so again you will ask me won't this start to smell won't it start to attract other kind of flies and insects so as you can see there is a lid on top of this bucket and this bucket in the middle is obviously sealed and this bucket also is obviously sealed so it might produce a little bit of smell but then you have to understand that if this is placed outside into your garden somewhere then this is a really good way of upcycling your waste right so it's ultimately you need to understand the cycles and if you are adding to the cycles you don't need to buy the fertilizers so we have gone again over time and i think we should keep the classes more than 1 hour but uh, yeah let me just quickly finalize what the organic fertilizers are and then we'll start tomorrow so we are actually just finishing but just uh, one last thing that i need to say uh, the bio fertilizers or the organic waste food is in the soil just bio fertilizers will have to be given regularly if the soil has no organic waste in it we need to understand that when we are using bio fertilizers we are actually giving to the microbes and the bacteria and they also in turn need the organic waste so you cannot just pour and pour all this liquid fertilizers and there is no organic waste in your garden so you need to understand and remember that leaves leaves were the first form of organic waste that you need so you need to use the decomposed leaves also so that the microbes and the bacteria which are there in the liquid fertilizer they get food to eat otherwise they will die this bio slurry that we talked about this bio slurry is just a good fertilizer if the soil already is full of compost and humus otherwise this bio slurry will be have to be given regularly to the crop or the plants that you have so you need to use leaves together with this all these fertilizers okay. um bio slurry has to be brewed for 14 days as we had discussed you take uh, one or two cakes of uh, cow dung 
you mix it with water and you have to like brew it like basically leave it outside you know mixing it a couple of times otherwise the methane gas can kill the plant there is methane gas being released from that bio uh, from that cow dung so that will kill the plant it is very hot in nature that liquid is very hot in the we can say that and that goes to the uh, system and it it, uh, it it burns away the roots so you need to brew it for 14 to 15 days just leave it out in the open and just keep on mixing it with a stick a worm based fertilizers can uh, need care and attention periodically having said that they are the best way to uh, rid green waste at home and upcycle into the garden manure so we discussed that the worms are living things again they have to be taken care of like this is one way of taking care of them is by using pots clay pots and water so you are using that temperature difference from the outside and the pot will cool that down and it will drop on the worms and the worms are acting and nicely eating away the compost and the dung and then once they eating that water also trickles down and takes those nutrients passes through the sand passes through the pebble and then gets collected here so you are actually supposed to be very careful with these kind of systems because they have live worms even the worm towers have the live worms so you need to take care of them because they are live worms okay so if uh, we have any questions again i would encourage you to give it in the group and uh, we will continue tomorrow i believe that we have had a, a right session right now until now we have any if you have any questions or queries i am most welcome it gets interesting when you guys are also having involved in this through asking me questions it gets to me to think also in another ways of thinking and it's interactive as i said so let's keep it interactive in the group and uh, hope to see you tomorrow okay thank you